Love State's program in visual impairments presents Tech Talk number nine, Tactile Design and Production Methods. Presented by Media and Accessible Design Laboratory, MADLAB, San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Greg Corret, Director, Frank Welty, Accessible Media Specialist, BJ Dietz Epstein, Senior Designer. Welcome to Tech Talk number nine. Uh, we're here tonight to learn from some experts in tactile graphics design and production. And with us today, um, I have my co-host, Nick Sisanis, who directs the Comic Studies program at San Francisco State. Um, I coordinate the Visual Impairments Teaching Preparation Program um, at, also at San Francisco State. And this is part of a, um, a, a, a grant that um, Nick and I applied for from SF State and it's funding a semester delving into the, the fun topic of uh, comics accessibility. So this is uh, learning a little bit about uh, some of the possible design and production methods available. Um, and we have BJ Epstein, Greg Carrot, and uh, Frank Welty from the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind. And these guys are part of the MAD Lab. So I'm gonna hand it off to them and disappear into the background. And you guys can introduce yourselves and just jump right in. And for anybody watching this, uh, feel free to plop your questions into the chat, whether uh, it's on YouTube or um, on Zoom. And so we can go ahead and get started. So thank you guys uh, so much for coming tonight and look forward to learning from you. Yeah, thank you, Ting. Hello, um, I'm Greg Corret. I'm the director of the Media and Accessible Design Lab at the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Francisco otherwise known as the Mad Lab. Um, accompanying me today are Frank Welty, who is a um, senior accessible media specialist. You wanna say hi, Frank? Hey there. And BJ Epstein, who is a senior designer in the Mad Lab. BJ? Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll have our contact information at the end, um, but if you ever do want to get in touch with us about anything, we have our email address here on the screen. You can write us at madlab, one word, M-A-D-L-A-B, at lighthouse-sf.org. So what we do at the Mad Lab, um, we provide access to information primarily for blind people and excuse me, non-visual learners. Uh, for the purposes of today's talk, I will say access to visually conveyed information. Text becomes braille, images become raised line drawings. Uh, we call this the language of lines. We design and produce a lot of tactile images, maps, and touch installations for education, museums, national parks, theme parks, transit agencies. Um, we've even done comics projects uh, for the Charles M. Schultz Museum up in Petaluma, for Marvel. Um, we even had a cameo in the Daredevil television series that ran on Netflix, where uh, Daredevil is going to do some spelunking in the sewer system of New York City, and he needed a Braille map for that episode and uh, BJ actually got to design that map and you know it had a brief fleeting appearance on the screen for a few seconds. Because our audience today um, includes comics artists and others outside of the field of visual impairment, our presentation will differ a bit than if we were solely addressing teachers of the visually impaired or TVIs. Uh, the jobs and experience of comics artists and TVIs differ. So we'll be providing a bit more background and context for non-TVI folks. Where the two jobs are similar is that both groups are concerned with helping the reader perceive, analyze, and understand visual information. Essentially helping the reader um, picture concepts with their mind's eye. So it goes from the page through the eyes or the fingertips into the brain. 
comics artists work in an artistic medium uh, rather than diagrammatic, which is what's mostly found in textbooks. Um, and they have to contend with layouts and narrative forms and other complexities of the comics medium, but the essentials are the same. Uh, BJ, can we check out that agenda? Yes. yes. So by way of providing background and context, no discussion of tactile graphics uh, production would be complete without some mention of Braille. So we will begin things there. Uh, Frank will kick that off. Um, having some basic understanding will come in useful if you decide to make your own Braille or play around with layout. Tactile design considerations. People tend to think you can take a visual image without modification and simply make it feelable. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. A tactile graphic is not an exact reproduction. It's a representation of a print graphic designed in a manner that is most meaningful to the reader. So up on the screen, BJ threw up a slide, resolution and simplicity. So on the left, you'll notice that a photo of a bear looks very much like a real bear, but a tactile graphic of a bear feels nothing like a bear or not like a real bear anyway. You know, this is an example of where like visual acuity of color, foreground and background, perspective, shadows and light um, is really more adept than tactual acuity. So one of the big takeaways today is that images to be read by touch must be as uncluttered as possible clean and concise. Um, so we're gonna talk about good tactile design principles, best practices so that whatever production methods uh, you use, you'll get good results. Something that's aesthetically pleasing, legible, meaningful to a blind person working in a tactile medium. And finally, um, tactile production methods. Um, We'll talk about DIY approaches such as collage uh, that don't cost a lot or have a high learning curve. And we'll talk about the computer driven methods we use at the Lighthouse and that are used in the alternative formats industry at large. Some of which are likely to be found at the uh, Disability Programs and Resource Center on campus. Uh, at state at, at San Francisco State, it's called the DPRC. Um, and I haven't spoken to those folks about this, but they might help you in your, your um, accessible graphics endeavors. Um, so that brings us to Braille. Frank, do you wanna give us the, uh, the Braille tour? Certainly. If you're going to do tactile graphics, whether that's in an educational context or whether it's for comics, at some point you're going to want to incorporate Braille into the, into the graphic. Because if you think about the elements of a comic, whether that's, you're talking about color, shading, uh, lines, and of course there's text as part of comics. So if you're going to render that in a form that's accessible to blind people, along with raising the lines and using texture shading to represent colors, you're going to want to represent the text. And the way you do that is through the communication system of blind people around the world, and that's Braille. Braille is amazing because Braille has been around for almost 200 years, and it was invented by a blind person for blind people. At the what, probably one of the very first examples of the term nothing without us, without us. <laughs> I mean, nothing about us without us. Uh, Braille was invented in the 1820s by a French school student named Louis Braille. And so he, they, they put his name on it. And people get scared when they think of Braille because they hear that Braille is hard. And how do you pro possibly read that? It's not actually that bad. In fact, I argue that if you can count to 10, you're smart enough to learn Braille and I'll show it to you. 
let's talk about what Braille is all about. First thing to know about Braille is that the characters in Braille do not look like characters in print. So for example, a Braille letter A does not look like a print letter E. A Braille letter L does not look like a print letter L. But what we do instead is that we use a very simple form to represent each Braille character. Each Braille character is known as a cell. A Braille cell is perfectly designed so that it, it fits under one finger so that I can feel a character without moving my finger to read a Braille character. And that Braille character is a simple array of six Braille bumps or dots. And the Braille dots are arranged in two columns with three dots in each column. And that simple six dot form make is the basis for all Braille characters. Now you might think, how can somebody possibly be re represent all of the characters of a language with just six dots? It actually works really well because each dot is, it's kind of a digital thing where either the dot is there or it's not there in its given position. So you can have patterns of up to 64 distinct braille characters represented in one braille cell. You know, if you, that's two raised to the power of six. And the blank space is a cell where there are no dots appearing. So the other 63 combinations make up the various Braille characters. So Louis Braille did something smart. He took the first 10 letters of the alphabet and he signed them, he assigned them each a particular Braille configuration or shape, A through J, in, and he used just the top four dots in the Braille cell and left the bottom dots off. So you're looking at an image of the Braille alphabet from A through J. I have no idea why he chose those particular patterns, but they are the basis for the entire Braille alphabet. So like I said, if you can count the 10 and learn those 10 simple Braille shapes, you, you're halfway there. Because what he did then was he took the next 10 characters in the alphabet and he repeated. He just took those same 10 characters and added the lower left dot of the cell. Like the K is just like the A, except for the lower left dot. L is just like the B, except for the lower left dot, right up the T. So there, without having to count past 10, you're still, you've still got 20 characters in the alphabet. And then he filled out the rest of the alphabet, starting with U by doing both bottom dots. So the U looks like the K, looks like the A, and so forth, except for one letter. You see how the W is off in the corner of the, of, this, of the screen there? The reason is that back in the 1820s, the French language, the French alphabet hadn't yet added W. So W didn't get included in the pattern when Braille was originally invented. So to this day, W in all languages does not follow the pattern. It's the only one that doesn't. And, uh, but you see, you have that simple pattern. So how do you do numbers? Instead of uh, the, the, you take the letters A through J again and you just add a symbol to it that tells us that's a digit, one through zero instead of being A through J. So how do you do capital letters? Do you have different shapes for capital letters? No, all you do is you take a letter and then you put a little dot in front of it in, in the character before it, in the cell before it, and that turns a letter into a capital letter. So the letter itself doesn't change shape. It just adds this dot in front to tell me it's a capital letter. And Braille does that all over the place using the basic shapes of the Braille alphabet and adding characters in adjacent cells to give it different meanings. And you build, we build up the whole Braille character set on those very simple terms. So what does that mean for you as a, as a designer? It means have set, has several implications. First of all, Braille characters are much bigger than standard print characters. Roughly speaking, a Braille character is the equivalent of a print character written in 24 point font. That means that a full page of Braille, or rather a full page of print basically turns out to be the equivalent of three Braille pages. So what that means is that 
in your, when you're designing your tactile graphic or your cartoon, if you want to add text in, in Braille, keep in mind that it's going to take up the space of a 24 point font. Second, Braille text does not change size or shape. You know, for example, italic Braille is not re represented by different shaped characters. Capitalization is not represented by different shape or size characters. There is no such thing as Braille small print or Braille large print. It's all the same size. So when you're doing your designs and you take a piece of text and you convert it to Braille, and we'll talk about that a little later, always it'll be the Braille characters will be the exact same will take up the exact same amount of space and you'll have to work around that. So what it means is that you'll wanna keep your, your braille short and you wanna make sure there's enough room for the braille characters and also enough room around it and adjacent lines so that the lines don't interfere with the braille characters. Because not only are braille characters a fixed shape, but they're a fixed distance apart, both vertically and horizontally. So those are the important things to know about braille. Now, you don't have to become a Braille expert in order to produce Braille characters. Uh, there are, are both uh, apps that you can obtain as freeware. There's one called uh, a Braille Blaster from the American Printing House for the Blind that will let you take a piece of text and turn it into Braille characters. And there are also uh, web-based services where you can type in some text and it'll reproduce the Braille characters for you. And then you can just copy those characters into your design. So it's uh, again, very, can be relatively simple. You don't have to become a braille expert to produce the braille. One thing to remember though, is that braille is a tactile medium. We've actually run into situations where somebody produced a sign that they thought was gonna be ADA compliant and they put nice braille characters on them in print with no texture. In other words, to me, they were invisible. So Braille characters have to be raised just like the lines have to be raised. So that's Braille. And if anybody has any questions about Braille, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, we will move to the next topic. Do we have any questions? Uh, not yet, Frank. I think we're... Um, okay, we can this is just such great it i know how broad and complex this topic is and this is just such an easy breakdown so very impressed and that's the thing about braille is that it, it's it's designed in such a way that you can you can make it really simple or you can get fancy with it but it's i think it's more approachable than people realize you know what i wanted to jump in here and just add a couple things um we had a slide up there um called Braille Resources. So Ting, I think, has a bit.ly that she can throw in the chat where we compiled some resources, some PDFs um, that you can download. Um, and I just wanted to mention some of the things that are in there. Um, there is a PDF alphabet card as well as a full Braille chart. There are also links to um, free Braille transcription software. Uh, Frank mentioned one of them. Um, Braille Translator is a web app. Basically, you know, enter your text and it'll translate into Braille. Braille Blaster is a download. Uh, it runs on Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, one advantage of that, um, if you're doing layout and design, is that you can download Braille as an image or as ASCII. Um, if ASCII, then you will need Braille fonts on your computer. Um, the two that we included uh, links to in the reference, Braille 29 font is used to create tactile graphics that are embossed using the View Plus embossers. You'll hear more about that later. The font that is recommended for use with swell form or microcapsule paper is Braille Swell. And again, we haven't talked about embossers as swell form, but we will. So uh, file that away. Um, you can also punch your own Braille manually. And this can be practical for labeling or um, speech bubbles, I'm thinking. This most basic approach, and by far the cheapest, um, is with slate and stylus. So a slate, you can think of it like a 
baking muffin pan, but instead of depressions for muffins, it has this grid of tiny depressions of the six dot braille cells, just arrayed on a grid. So paper or label material placed between the two leaves is held securely in place. And with the stylus, um, you know, very much like the tip of a ballpoint pen, you punch your braille letters one dot at a time. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that you're punching on the reverse side of the paper, right? You have to flip the paper over to feel the raised dots. So you actually have to write the braille backwards. Uh, once you get the hang of it, punching braille dot by dot backwards isn't as tedious as it sounds. Like people will actually do this as a, a note taking device. Um, but another way to make braille labels is with a braille dymo tape labeler. Uh, pretty self-explanatory, um, you know, you spin the dial to choose the letter and you squeeze the handle. By the way, on that slide, that label that's on the right, I believe that's magnetic label, which is just kind of a cool idea that it doesn't have to be adhesive labels. You can make refrigerator magnets uh, out of braille. Um, mm -hmm. And I hesitate to mention it, but there's also a six dot braille label maker with a QWERTY keyboard and USB adapter that can be bought for around $800, which seems excessive for label making. But if you want to go that route, such a thing has been invented. Um, and, you know, in one final note, Frank did touch on italics and bold or capitalization. But for all you comics artists out there, um, you know, eye-catching techniques that are used in print and the array of fonts that are often used in comics, they have no equivalent in Braille. So if that's part of your, your style, that's just something that isn't going to uh, translate. And the other problem is that, that if, you, if, you were, if you do indicate things like bold and italic, that, that takes up more space because you have to use extra characters to explain that. So it's best to do without the fancy fonts when you're doing the Braille. Yeah. Now you can still use the fonts in print, but the Braille version will, will do without. Well, if I'm not mistaken, that actually does bring us to the tactile design considered portion of tonight's presentation. Mm -hmm. I think so. And I think that, does. and I think BJ, that means that you have something to say about all that, don't you? Uh, I certainly do. Okay, so uh, Frank and Greg brought you through the language of dots, and now we're going to talk about the language of lines. Uh, I often joke that I am a designer and my job is to draw lines. Uh, as a tactile designer, I draw tactile lines. But as Greg mentioned earlier, it's more than just taking the lines of something that is visually conveyed and raising them up. Um, so before we go into production, we have to consider design and the design is based on the method of production because the method of production will determine the design constraints that we have. So for instance, if you are designing for an embosser or if you are designing for a collage method, you're going to use very different design methods. You're going to use very different design constraints for each of those. Um, but before we get into that even, we have to think about, is this appropriate for a tactile graphic? So on the screen right now is a decision tree that asks, is this appropriate for a tactile graphic. Um, we have to make a decision about what would be most clearly understood by the reader. Will this be best described as, or best put forward as a description, as a tactile graphic, or as a combination of a tactile graphic with description and or labels? And what you're going to ask yourself is, is the information a repeat of facts in the text? Would the information be more meaningful in text form? 
And does the graphic require the reader to use visual discrimination or visual perception? And if the answer to any of those is yes, you're not going to want to produce a tactile graphic. You'll want to use a text description. But if the actual object is unavailable, too small, too large, or too dangerous to be examined by touch and perceive the details, um, then you'll want to produce a graphic. If the reader needs information from a map or figure or graph to participate in discussions, answer questions, or complete a task, you will also want to pr or produce a tactile graphic. Uh, if the answer to those last two questions is no, then again, you will not produce a tactile graphic. And keep in mind that there are some complex images that are never going to be able to provide meaningful information for someone who is blind or low vision uh, trying to read that image tactilely. So for instance, um, a large crowd scene, like something you might see in Where's Waldo is never going to give you the best image tactilely because it's going to be too cluttered. Whereas if you say a large crowd scene in which Waldo hides, that produces a very good mental image. Um, so a picture is worth a thousand words, but sometimes a few well-chosen words can be worth a mental picture. So think about that carefully when you are deciding whether or not to produce a tactile graphic. There are some important things to keep in mind uh, when you are creating a tactile graphic. You want to convey only essential information. So uh, we've gone through the decision tree and now you're going to decide what is the essence of the thing that you are trying to produce in tactile graphic? Um, you want to think of your priorities. Parking lots, for instance, you might think, well, we don't want to include parking lots in a map because blind people aren't going to be driving, so we don't need to include parking lots. However, uh, parking lots can be meeting places, sometimes public transit or uh, campus shuttles will pick up and drop off in parking lots. They're also dangerous areas for a blind traveler. So you, you would want to know as a blind traveler that there is a parking lot there where there will be vehicles moving around. Uh, so you don't just discount them because blind people don't drive. However, you would not necessarily need to include something like an electric vehicle charger. Um, that might be important information in a map for someone who is sighted, but it's not necessarily going to be for someone who is blind. You also don't want to think about including things that are easily movable like trash cans, um, benches, etc. Uh, so those things would be not necessary, not the essence of the place that you're trying to describe. Number two is that clutter is the enemy. Um, and this occurs when components of the tactile graphic are too close together because while you can see things that are very close together, when you try to feel things that are very close together, they can blur one into the other and not give you good tactile definition. You can also have a problem with clutter if the items are so similar that they're hard to distinguish tactilely. And Braille itself adds clutter because it's so large that it may obliterate part of the tactile graphic. And you can address this with adding auditory information, but that's a little beyond the scope of today's discussion. So we'll move on from that and go into clean and concise, which is the third thing to keep in mind 
you want the clarity of your components to uh, really stand out. So if you have two adjacent textures, you want to leave some blank space between them so that it is easy to tell where one stops and the next begins or where lines cross other lines or textures, it's advisable to put a blank space around those lines so that you can tell exactly where things are crossing. Yo, BJ, I, yes. can I jump in? I just, I just mm -hmm. had a thought, I, you know, I don't know if it's totally germane, but it crossed my mind when you were talking about conveying only the most essential info I was thinking about um, New Yorker cartoons and like what I'd call like the classic New Yorker cartoon is always a single frame, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if you were to try to, you know, describe that, you know, to a person who couldn't see it and try to do so in 25 words or less, right? Mm -hmm. Because what you're trying to do is drill down to what is the most essential information you need to like deliver this joke. Like, where's the gag? Do you read the caption and then describe the picture? Do you describe the picture, then read the caption? And what in the picture do you actually describe? That could also be used not just for written description, but to give you some clues about what is actually important to represent tactually in this drawing. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was yes. one. That's a great thought and that's a great point. Uh, I had a teacher in high school who used to make us write what he called logos, um, which was distilling the essence of uh, either a chapter or sometimes a whole book into 25 words or less. Drove me nuts, but it was a really good exercise. And it's especially a good exercise for this exact thing is that you're trying to convey only the most essential information. You have to select each of those words very, very carefully you don't want to add very, very, you don't want to add and or the, you have to select each word with precision. Um, so this slide shows what I'm talking about with the simplification. On the left-hand side is a visual image of a campus map. And on the right-hand side, is the tactile image of that same campus map. Now you'll notice a few things that may look a little different in the right side picture from the left one. Uh, the shape of the buildings has disappeared and the buildings have been replaced by a solid filled gray square. The parking lots have been replaced by uh, dotted filled squares. And you'll notice some thick dark lines that represent the streets, some thin dashed lines that represent major footpaths, and some thin solid lines that represent where the map is going to be broken into smaller sections that will be zoomed into in later pictures of the map or later pages of the map, excuse me. Um, so this is conveying only the essential information, the fact that there are buildings, the fact that there are parking lots, uh, the, the sort of, oh, excuse me, sorry, that went Back the ovals on the right hand side are with braille inside them are uh, train and tram stops. So for the campus, uh, public transit is noted and obviously the streets and the footpaths, um, but not all of the footpaths, just the major ones because too many of those footpaths would create clutter and um, we left out the color coding, we left out the building names that would go into the zoomed in versions of these maps. We left out 
things like statues, uh, EV charging stations or electrical vehicle charging stations. And the roads you'll notice are broken where they cross those thin solid lines that represent the breakdown of the map. Um, and yeah. we use simple textures and braille abbreviations. So you'll notice that the, the braille labels around the edges of the map are two and three character abbreviations. So because braille is so large a font, uh, or so large in size, it would be too much to fit onto a page if you were trying to fit North University Drive, for instance. Um, so that becomes N-U-N, North University Drive. Um, and that would be linked to a key or legend that explains what those abbreviations are. This clearly shows that you can't just raise the lines of visual and add braille. You have to make design decisions. And something that you can use to make those design decisions is the BANA guidelines and standards for tactile graphics. And that's the Braille Authority of North America guidelines and standards for tactile graphics. This is listed in the resources that Ting will have for you. And it's a treasure trove of this kind of information, but it is geared towards textbook production and educational material. And it's a pretty weighty piece of reading. It can be a bit overwhelming, but there are a few more things that we can pull from it that are a few more uh, salient design principles. So additional things to keep in mind Modifications to size, position, or layout may be made to an illustration to clarify the presentation. So the size of something that is very detailed may be enlarged to show those details. For instance, if you have a picture of the, the human body showing the bones inside the body, um, the hand might be enlarged to show all of the bones inside the hand. Now, nobody's going to think that uh, that there's somebody standing around with one normal sized hand and one enormous hand that's the, <laughs> half the size of their body, um, but it's modified in size so that it, you can clarify the presentation. Uh, number two is if the depth, if the concept of depth is not required, a three dimensional view should be changed to a two dimensional view. Uh, Three-dimensional things are hard to read tactilely because it simply looks like a different shape or things can look different sizes, i.e. distant objects look smaller than closer ones. So if you can create a two-dimensional view, that's going to be easier to understand. Description and labels may be used to convey information. You want to use braille labels when they'll fit in the available space. Otherwise use symbols, braille abbreviations or numbers tied to a key or legend. Uh, you'll wanna keep with two or three braille character abbreviations most of the time. Uh, that's the standard and that usually gives you enough, um, enough different combinations of abbreviations to cover what you need to. And finally, a tactile graphic is a representation of a print graphic designed in a manner that is most meaningful to the reader. It is not an exact reproduction. So the way to think about this is that if you're translating, for instance, from English to Spanish or French, you're not going to translate literally word for word. You're going to translate into what is most meaningful to someone who is taking that information in, in French or Spanish. And so before we move on to production methods, let's look at one more example of the things that we've been talking about. The image you see on the screen now is Rosie the Riveter. 
And this is, uh, as a painting, sighted people are familiar with this image, but blind or visually impaired people may not be familiar with this image because it may not have been produced in a format that they can use. So we took this on um, and I made some of the design decisions on how to represent the 3D shapes in 2D ways and what to prioritize in terms of composition and content. So creating this iconic painting in a tactile graphic presents an entry into the art world and popular culture that is often limited for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, this tactile graphic, which I don't know if you can see on your screens, but there are some raised lines that uh, are uh, let me get my pointer over there. So you can see some raised lines that are showing around her face, around her arms and the sleeve she's rolling up. And you might even be able to see some braille along the sleeve and on her blue shirt. Uh, so let me get my pointer to the right place again. This is a close up of Rosie's face in the tactile image that I was just sharing with you. And you can see that her hair, her eye, her mouth are all labeled, as well as her hand in the upper right hand corner, which is balled into a fist. And even though the facial features are commonly represented by outlines for visual representation, tactilely, these lines are not so straightforward. So for instance, why does a nose get represented by these few squiggles? Why isn't it a uh, uh, line down the bridge of the nose or perhaps a round shape at the tip of the nose? There are a number of different ways that you can represent a 3D object and how do we choose those particular lines to outline a nose? Why does, where does the nose end and the cheek begin? Um, why not use a line down the ridge of the nose or a, and or a round shape at the tip? If we use the common line drawing conventions that we would see in a visual image, this allows people who are blind the opportunity to participate in discussions about uh, whether we should represent the nodes a different way. Um, and because the tactile outlines alone might not be enough to under be understood, we included these labels. So even though the nose is not labeled, the eye and the mouth are and you can infer from what you know about a human face that the nose is going to be sort of in the middle of those things. Um, the reason why the nose wasn't labeled was because there wasn't space for the word nose in braille. And the other labels would give context. We used recommendations in the BANA guidelines and standards for tactile graphics to determine distances between the labels and the other tactile elements. So for instance, there's at least an eighth of an inch of space between the label for the eye and the drawing of the eye itself. Um, and then finally, we show a version of the tactile graphic on the left that shows just the tactile so that you can see it quite easily distinguished from the tactile graphic that is overlaid with the visual image on the right hand side. Um, a few things to note here are, let me get my 
uh, pointer again. Okay, so the speech bubble above Rosie's head says we can do it. And that is in a large sort of rounded font, which may or may not be legible to someone who's blind. So we've duplicated that in Braille below, we can do it. We've also noted in Braille that this is a blue background for the speech bubble and a yellow background for Rosie herself. You'll see different textures that were used for her hair, her eyes, her mouth, uh, her red scarf, her blue shirt. There's a patch that she has on the collar of her shirt that was too small to render tactilely, so it was rendered with just a filled in striped texture. And if we'd had room, we might have labeled it patch. And that's where things like a, an accompanying description come in handy because you can describe that she has a patch on the, uh, on the collar of her shirt and you can describe that it has an image of a woman with her hair done up in the scarf, just like Rosie, um, but it's not going to be something that would be tactilely legible. So think about the needs of the person reading your image by touch. Are they going to be able to determine what is going on in the image? Does it need labels or an accompanying description. Um, and remember that the success of your productions is dependent on the design choices that you make. So make good choices. And with that, I will hand it over to Greg and uh, he will tell you about production. Yeah, by the way, I really like this slide. I think that's a beautiful example you know, that really illustrates <clears throat> the approach to, you know, distilling the tactile essence of a thing. I mean, I think that's a brilliant line drawing representation of that poster. It's very super clean. And the other thought I had just, it's going back a, um, a few minutes, but when BJ mentioned that if the concept of depth is not required, if that is not essential, that three dimensional should be changed to two dimensional, but I wanted to throw in, um, thinking of three-dimensional, I want to use the term isometric view. So if you're trying to picture something that is seen on an angle, on a bias, visually, the brain is able to make sense of perspective and foreshortening. But tactually, that is not necessarily going to read. Again, um, a picture of a bear looks like a bear, but a raised line drawing of a bear does not feel like a bear. Um, I don't know, a picture of a train boxcar is seen from the top of a building looking in a distance, looks like a train boxcar. But if you tactually that perspective, it's not gonna read as a rectangle. It's not mm -hmm. uh, you know, a um, rectilinear shape anymore. It's yeah. And it's just going to read weird. So I just yeah. kind of think about that. You know, that's going to affect your drawings, unless you draw um, really flat, like Charles Schultz. Yeah. Where everything's so, pretty much flat in the foreground. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, Rosie's hand is labeled hand here because you've got mm -hmm. the foreshortening and the the tucking of the fingers behind the sleeve that she's got rolled up, and then her other hand is labeled fist so that you can tell that it, she's making a fist with her hand, her other hand, uh, rather than when we started, we had just labeled it hand, but Frank let us know that labeling it fist would make it more meaningful for the blind reader. Yeah, a little description goes a long way and it's definitely best practice to any time you introduce or show someone a tactile graphic to provide some context for that image to just set it up um, mm -hmm. so that people don't have to try to piece it together. Um, I sometimes use this example 
uh, Frank, correct me if I'm, I'm off base, but you know, visually people who use their site, they tend to see the big picture at a glance and then zero in on details. But if you're reading by touch, you're doing it the other way around. You're starting with small amounts of information and building up the big picture. So, you know. That's correct close. because yeah. most of your sensitivity is in the fingertips, which means that you're covering a very small piece of the image at any one time. I mean, you may do a quick scan over it, but even there you're, you're, you're scanning in, in, in small pieces. So that's a good point. Like I said, each Braille character is the size to fit under a fingertip. And, and that's, that's essentially the lens that one is experiencing for a tactile graphic. Yeah, so yeah, I guess we can, we can move on now to tactile um, production and duplication methods. Um, we've in, it's in the resources listed, BANA guidelines and standards for tactile graphics. They have a whole unit dedicated to production and duplication. Um, production methods vary. No one method is better than any other. Um, they all have their pros and cons, their trade-offs. It really comes down to clarifying your objectives and what equipment is available to you. Uh, the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So clarify your objectives. So ask yourself these questions. Replication. Is what you're doing a one-off for a single reader or are multiple copies needed? Um, you know, for a single reader, you could probably just make something out of collage versus if you need a lot of copies, you might wanna do some computer assisted digital design. Um, durability, does this object need to stand up to repeated use over time? Or is it, I don't know, topical, the day's news, it's gonna be read once and discarded. Um, so materials could be embossed paper versus, or, or swell form, or it could be something more durable like thermoform or collage. Um, efficiency, how much time and labor will you need to apply to this task? Um, making tactile graphics can be very time consuming. So, you know, think about that. Uh, which production method will provide the best readable graphic? Um, we've heard from teachers of the visually impaired. Many of them prefer swell form over embossed as being easier for their students to read. Um, UV printing makes outstanding tactile. But, you know, both of those methods are very time consuming um, compared to embossing. And when it comes to UV, it actually is complicated and expensive compared to either of the other methods. Um, and finally, you know, what equipment is available to produce the graphic, which I realize now isn't on my slide, but, yeah. <laughs> but you know, think about that, what's available. So uh, yeah, what are these uh, various methods? Um, let's advance. So simple techniques. Um, here's a slide showing a couple examples of collage. Collage is a great place for the beginning tactile producer um, because there's very little expense. You get some materials, of course, but no complicated gear is needed. Um, basically, textured materials are glued onto a piece of paper to create a raised image. Uh, Common household items, string, sandpaper is great. Various grades of sandpaper for texture swatches, um, swatches of fabric, pasta. Um, you know, you can find all kinds of stuff at uh, Michael's. You know, you could go for wiki sticks, those kind of like wax pipe cleaner type things, um, foam board, decorative tapes. The other thing to bear in mind is that collage can also serve as a hard copy master for thermoform production. Um, by the way, a word about these collages that are on here, the one on the left um, so is some leaves that have been affixed to a piece of paper and some braille labels 
looks like those are probably done on like a Dymo tape labeler. I'm reminded of, um, you know, these things don't have, you don't have to overthink it. Like, why would you make a tactile graphic of a leaf if you can just show someone the leaf? We were actually approached by someone um, from a state park who wanted us to make some 3D objects, you know, for their visitor center. And they asked us to make like a 3D printed pine cone. And we're like, well, you could just show people a pine cone. It's better than <laughs> just show them the real thing. Um, and yeah, I lost my train of thought there, but yeah, why don't we go on to the next slide? Um, drawing, you know, there are tools out there, products called drawing boards. Um, drawings are made on a thin sheet of plastic, paper or foil atop a layer of hard rubber. So by lightly pressing down on the foil, lines will raise instantly forming the tactile image. Um, pictured here, uh, there's a tactopad and a sensational blackboard. I can't remember what the red one is. I think that's from APH, which means American Printing House for the Blind. Um, these are just a few examples. There are others. Um, and you know, it's it's a modest amount of money. I mean, the, the, the sensational blackboard, I think sells for about $35. I didn't look it up, but I trust the Tactipad, that yellow one on the right is probably a good deal more because as you can see, it's much more elaborate, it comes with a lot more hardware, you know, the protractors, the triangles, the rulers, et cetera. Um, looks like there's even a compass in there. But that's, you know, that's really quick way to do it. And the other cool thing about these drawing tools is that people who are blind themselves can use them to draw, to make their own images. Um, in a very easy way, because not all tactile, not all um, design software is really that accessible. There are a few exceptions that are designed with the needs of blind screen reader users in mind, but it's really not the norm and there's quite a learning curve involved there. Um, not in the slides, I don't have an example of this, but thermal powder, there is a YouTube link listed in the resources, this woman named Gina Kang. Um, thermal powder is cool. So in her example, she basically takes, um, is it Charles and his purple crayon? I should know this, right? <laughs> Somebody, some little kid in his purple crayon, right? He's drawing all over the world with his purple crayon. He's drawing the world, um, but very simple line drawings. So the ideal here with thermal powder is you trace whatever this drawing is with a glue stick. I think in the video, Gina uses um, a special type of pen where the mm -hmm. ink stays wet for a long time. You dust it with thermal powder, you brush away the excess, you run a heat gun over it to fuse the thermal powder, which hardens right into hard plastic, instant tactile graphic, simple, right? So, I mean, that should probably be in everybody's toolkit because it's so straightforward. Um, there are other methods, still simple, but requiring specialized equipment. And maybe these sorts of things uh, can be found at the Disability Programs and Resource Center on campus. We have them at the Lighthouse for the Blind ourselves. Um, we've moved on to swell form and thermoform. So swell form, sometimes also called microcapsule, um, is a really easy way to get into tactile graphics. Um, you can do free form drawing or computer assisted design, which it's a long word, but really it could be as simple as using Microsoft Word, you know, if you just want to insert objects and, you know, shapes, et cetera. I find swell form to be really gratifying because you see and feel your results immediately. This does require some gear and special materials. You need a swell form machine. You need swell form paper. You need a printer and or a black felt pen. Note, the black ink used on swell paper must be carbon-based ink. Sharpies don't work. Um, swell form machines cost about $1,400. 
swell paper, about $1.50 a sheet. Swell form paper, by the way, comes in many different names. It's known as swell paper, capsule paper, puff paper, pop-up paper, um, even Minolta paper. It's all basically the same material with a few variations. But um, it does seem to be, I don't know, the marketing of this product is kind of confused because it just comes under so many different names. Uh, the process. An image is drawn directly onto the swell paper, or if computer assisted, it's transferred onto swell paper using your printer. You then feed this black and white swell paper image into the swell form machine, which is basically a heat lamp. So how does it work? Swell paper has a suspension of micron sized polypropylene beads painted onto the paper. It works on the principle that the color black absorbs more heat. So when that black line or image or dot is on a piece of swell paper and you feed it into that heat lamp, it gets hotter than the area surrounding it. And at a certain temperature, these little beads explode and increase their volume rather dramatically, just like making popcorn. Um, lines puff up to a uniform height. I'm gonna digress slightly here with a couple of helpful hints. Um, by using colors other than black, you can add print labels to your document that won't puff up. So we discovered that of all the colors available to us in our laser printer, um, dark forest green must have some carbon in it because it puffed up, though not nearly as much as black. So that can introduce, you know, some subtlety, a little bit of nuance and variation in your textures. Um, if attempting textures, let's say you wanna, I don't know, do some hatch fill or something to represent hair or clothes, you might try using um, very thin strokes or very small dots to make up your pattern. The idea here is that less black means less thermal reaction. Um, you have to play around with it. Um, applying Braille. Remember the slate and stylus? With a slate, you can draw Braille right onto the paper. And you don't have to draw backwards. Um, if computer assisted design, then the Braille swell font is optimal. It's not necessary, but it is a slightly bigger font. And so it more black means more thermal, which means it raises and it's easier to read. Um, I digress, the process continued. So once you have your master copy, whether you drew it onto paper but, or, or it's digital, you print that image onto the swell paper. You can make as many copies as you need. Um, the actual printing of swell is a manual process. You have to feed sheets through one at a time, um, often running the same sheet multiple times to get the image to swell properly. Doesn't always work on the first pass. So it's slow compared to embossed reproduction. Um, a couple hazards to keep in mind. This is actually kind of important. If you're using a laser printer as your, your copier um, and printing multiple copies onto swell form paper, which is kind of plasticky, the fuser can get too hot and melt your swell form paper, um, leaving you with a hot gooey mess in your fuser um, that will harden as it cools. Um, you may not be able to clean your fuser. Um, printer make and model vary. Um, I've heard that you might be able to drill down into the on-screen menu and actually adjust the operating temperature of your fuser so that it doesn't get too hot. I tried to look this up in one of the uh, user operator manuals for a swell form printer and I couldn't actually find it, but somebody told me that, yeah, it says there's an ideal temperature. I don't know, it's somewhere between like 180 and 220 degrees, but I guess presumably fusers can get hotter than that. Um, just something to keep in mind. When we do have to run it through a laser printer, we just kind of do it in small batches so it doesn't overheat, which is kind of a pain. Um, 
And I also mentioned that um, swell form machines themselves can overheat. Um, uh, the P off, the one that's pictured there, actually has an automatic override. So if it gets too hot, it's going to shut down. Um, that's kind of a pain, but it's not as much of a pain as um, your thermoform or swell paper bursting into flames, which is what happened to BJ one time because she was using a machine that didn't have that feature. Um, so, you know, uh, hilarity and hijinks ensue. You know, it's, it's a grand adventure making thermoform, I mean, making a swell. But I like it. And, um, the other object pictured up there is a thermoform machine. This is also called vacuum form. And you've heard a little bit about this, right? You, if you make um, a collage mold or something, that can be your mold for thermoform. What is that? Coffee cup lids. Those are thermoformed. You, um, so for what we're talking about, you start with your hard copy, tactile graphic master, a heating component and vacuum pump, of the thermoform machine mold a plastic sheet to the shape of the hard copy master. Um, the thermoform machines and plastic sheets used for tactile and braille production are not the heavy duty machines that make coffee cup lids and vacuum formed packaging. Um, they're specially designed for tactile graphics and new thermoform machines run $3,200 to $4,200 but they've been around for decades, um, which means that they can be picked up, used for cheap or sometimes for free. Uh, the plastic sheets, they go under the brand name Braylon, costs about 14 cents a sheet. Braylon is really durable. Um, and once you have your hard copy master, duplication is fast. It too is a manual process. You feed sheets one at a time, but it's fast. Um, if replicating the same image, meaning you've just got like one master and you're just gonna make a bunch of them, bang, 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 bang. You know, I'd say maybe 10, 15 seconds per sheet. Um, I did six copies of a 15 page book. So I was swapping out masters. I, I did that in under an hour. Both Swell and Thermoform are simple machines, right? They require periodic maintenance and repair, but there's not a lot that can go seriously wrong with them. There's not a lot under the hood. They don't have motherboards, so you won't be talking to tech support. BJ has thoughtfully advanced the slide. Um, swell form versus Thermoform, there's actually images so you can see more like what this would really look like. You'll notice on the left, portrait of Frida Kahlo uses the same approach as Rosie the Riveter. The artwork looks very similar to what BJ shared earlier with Rosie, um, but that's pretty much what your swell image would look like. Um, and on the right is a sheet of thermoform. Um, it depicts, it's hard to see, it's really hard to photograph tactile that doesn't have ink incorporated into it, but it's um, a, a collection of arrowheads by the way, these were arrowheads that were all found at the lighthouse's Enchanted Hills camp um, up in Napa. When the fires burned through, we found a hunting site, um, an old, very, very old hunting gathering site. Um, yeah, so thermo thermoform is tactile only. There's no ink print. Um, let's move on to Braille embossers, which is the next slide. Okay, so this is getting more into the kind of territory of uh, the work that we tend to do. Braille embossers, by the way, do have motherboards. Um, you may very well get to know tech support on a first name basis if you work with Braille embossers. Um, Braille embossers are computer driven printers, but instead of text, they print Braille. Um, embossers come in two flavors those that can print tactile graphics and those that can't. Or really, I should say those that are designed specially to print tactile and those that maybe can, but that aren't really optimized to do that, they're made to print Braille. If graphics is your thing, you're gonna get a lot more flexibility and speed out of the graphics capable embossers. 
There's really only one company that specializes in tactile embossers, and that's View Plus. Um, that's what's pictured up here. Their machines run from $2,000 to $24,000. Um, there are other manufacturers, um, Humanware, they offer the Romeo, the Juliet, the Phoenix. They can all produce tactile graphics using the Firebird software, which comes bundled. Index embossers can do tactile graphics using Tactile View. That doesn't come bundled. That's yet another piece of software you have to get. Um, embossers print digital files. So a graphics file is created using vector-based tools like Illustrator or Inkscape or what have you, or software programs for Braille and graphics. As I mentioned, most embossers come bundled with proprietary software and then printed on a graphics embosser. Um, the electronic file has advantages over um, collage or other methods because it can be saved for further editing and duplication. They're easy to modify. I should mention here that embossers create lines by punching a lot of tightly spaced dots. So your line is really a series of points rather than a true solid line like you'd get with Swell. Um, the View Plus embossers allow for some variation in dot height. It's subtle, but it really helps us in our design with creating textures. Um, and graphics embossers come in a few flavors. So there are tractor pin fed models that like dot matrix printers of your run accordion fold paper. Um, there's a picture up there if you weren't around in the days of yore and don't know what a dot matrix printer is. Uh, yeah, the paper's on a continuous scroll. And in the background behind that braille embosser is a form burster. And that's what after the it embosses, you actually have to feed it through the form burster to split it into its individual sheets. Um, and there are models out there with cut sheet feeders akin to modern copiers. Um, tractor fed is ideal for big print runs. It's very reliable, just chugs along. Cut sheet is slower, uh, more prone to paper jams, smaller paper feeders. So you gotta like swap it out more often if you're doing big quantities. Um, but you have more options for types of paper and sizes. And you can run pre-printed material through the embosser because it's you can't really print on tractor feed paper, right? But cut sheet, you can run through a printer and then you could run it through your tactile graphics embosser. Um, getting both ink print and emboss on the same sheet. By the way, there are also a few embossers that do both ink print and braille tactile, right? So now, now it's getting really spiffy. Uh, that red one pictured, I think it's called the spot dot. That is an inkjet printer wedded to a braille embosser all in one unit. Um, although I don't know if it's a color inkjet, but they make those too. That's probably where it starts costing $24,000. Um, those are what we tend to prefer at the lighthouse. We like to combine visual and tactile so that sighted people can use this stuff too. Um, also, I mean, also really most people who are legally blind have some vision. And if they have some vision, they're gonna leverage that vision and you know get as much out of it as they can. So we like doing high contrast, you know, large print fonts and all that. Um, by the way, working with machines that are designed to do both ink and emboss makes registration and alignment between the visual and tactile a lot easier. Um, so just know that if you're gonna be printing on material and running it through a, a graphics embosser, you're probably gonna to have to fuss a lot with lining stuff up so it comes out the way you want it. BJ, would you advance the slide to color versus texture? Yeah. So this is an example of our View Plus um, production. The visual artboard is on the left. The tactile is on the right. You know, again, similar to what 
BJ shared with Rosie the Riveter, where you can see the visual compared to the tactual. Um, it's not, it's kind of hard for me to photograph the actual print. So these are just, you know, the, the PDF of the artboards. But I wanted to share this too, because, um, well, two reasons. One, the page prints full color, but notice that the emboss artwork is grayscale. In our process, the darker the hue, the more pronounced the tactile. That's how we get gradations in height and textural nuance. The dark lines are gonna be raised more than gray lines. And the other reason I wanted to show this is how we interpreted color. So this is a pie chart. Um, textures, so we basically converted each color to a texture that corresponds. Textures have to feel very different from each other to be recognized as different by touch. Um, notice that pie wedge without texture. I guess in color, it's I'm gonna say it's a light blue, maybe an aqua tint. I guess that's the science farm raised. In our tactile, there's no texture there. So the absence of texture actually serves as a tactual element. It's smooth, everything else is not. Um, in this example, five distinct textures were used. This is about the maximum number to use in any given piece. Um, more, and it gets hard for the reader to remember what's what. It really does become a bit of cognitive overload. Okay, um, high tech. There are yet even more ways to produce tactile stuff. Um, sculpture, boss relief, 3D printed, UV flatbed printed, um, talking tactile, right? Where you actually add auditory labels where you have some sort of, um, there are methods for having um, touch sensitive, you know, conductive paints or, you know, other interactive modes so that you can fit more information into your graphic. As you can see, there's some real limitations to Braille, right? Braille's big, it takes up a lot of space and it itself introduces clutter, obfuscating whatever you're trying to convey. Um, perhaps easier to address in textbooks because you can have an image paired with a key or legend. I could see where that approach could start getting um, laborsome for the reader if you were doing that in a comics style. But talking tactile, as BJ mentioned earlier, it's getting way beyond the scope of this. Um, even things like sculpture or boss relief, right? You're gonna start getting into techniques with, um, you know, CNC milling or even just, you know, sculpting by hand. Even that gets beyond today's presentation, which is really trying to focus on tactile graphics. Of these many methods, UV, the only one that we use to produce tactile graphics is UV flatbed printing. Um, there are some examples there on the screen. And I think they do pretty good to convey the level of tactual detail. Um, on the left, the man wearing um, a buffalo headdress, there's a little bit of glare in the photo, but you can basically see it's a photorealistic representation. And then BJ has created tactual elements for the vest, for the shirt, for the feathers, for the hair, outlines for the face, mouth, and nose. And on the right is something a little more whimsical. That's actually a close-up of a map of Oakland. Um, I don't remember. Bananas probably means it's a produce market. Uh, I'm guessing that purple thing that is shaped kind of like a house is a house. Maybe that red X is a hospital. I don't know. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't remember what the swirls are. I'm guessing that the all the- fog of unknowing. Oh, the fog of unknowing. So this, the, the person who made this map, Amy Mason, she's blind herself. And it was a map of when she moved to Oakland, her, her understanding of Oakland. Um, so the fog of unknowing, these are whole swaths of the city that she has no idea what's there. Um, but UV flatbed printing in and of itself is very involved, complicated, the machinery is complex. Um, even that gets beyond really the scope of today's talk. I wanted to share it, 
but it's really used more for museum quality work. It's very durable. I mean, we use it for outdoor, you know, anything that's intended to be outdoors, like let's say for the National Park Service or museums, you know, uh, theme parks and the like. So I just wanted to show you that, but it starts, you know, it's not really that practical for uh, everyday, everyday use. Um, so yeah, let me just recap a few points. Not everything that appears as a visual graphic needs to be a tactile graphic. Um, making a graphic tactile can be as simple as raising lines and adding braille, but you really have to use your critical thinking skills to determine which lines to raise. And the big takeaway, right, the key word of tactile graphics is simplify, simplify, simplify. And, you know, the success of your production, it's dependent on the design choices you make and thinking about the needs of the person reading your image by touch. Um, you know, if you do these things, great results are possible. And there are resources available. Um, you know, check out the resources we're sharing with you. Um, you don't have to do this alone. You might, um, you know, check out the, is it the DPRC? You can also contact us at the Mad Lab at the Lighthouse, you know, and we're happy to talk to you about your project and we may be able to be of assistance to move things along. Um, if we have time, and I think we have a few minutes, are there any questions that have been piling up? Because we could pick some off. I wanna chime one in here, this is Frank. And I just want to mention that one thing that resource that you may want to do is if you're when you're producing tactile graphics is reach out to a an end user to yes. critique your work. I think you'll find that very helpful. And by end user, he, Frank means a you blind know, person. <laughs> show it to a blind person <laughs> for real. You know, like yeah. don't even guess. Like you, you'll beat yourself up, you know, creating this thing, and then you'll show it to someone to be like, well, that doesn't work. So you know, get feedback. Um, you know, another, a thought I, I was thinking of sharing if we had time, and it looks like we got a couple minutes here. Um, Chansey Fleet is a Lighthouse board member, and she's also the founder of the Dimensions Project. That's a free open lab for the exploration and creation of accessible images and non-visual approaches to visual arts. And, um, I think she expresses this idea best. So she said that if you're a sighted person from earliest childhood, you've been exposed to so many images and pictures that your image fluency and your perceptual and creative abilities around spatial information just blossom. And so there's a real correlation here, by the way, between visual conveyed information and spatial information. Um, Anyway, if you are a blind person, she said contrasts, you know, you're lucky if when you're in preschool or K through 12, you have access to a few select images. Um, maybe you have access to drawing tools, but probably not. Um, most of the images that you do see are given to you in a textbook and they're gonna be few and far between and associated with homework. Um, and you know, don't, don't get her wrong, she's not knocking um, tactile graphics and STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, math. I mean, that stuff is indispensable. Um, they help blind and visually impaired people access the information that they need to succeed in school, in employment. It's what the point she's making is it's just not necessarily the images that pique your curiosity when you're growing up. You know, the mm -hmm. stuff that your friends and everyone else is into. Um, and this dearth of accessible images is what Chansey calls image poverty. The results being that if you're blind, you know, you don't even know necessarily what your perceptual and creative abilities around spatial information could be because you have had such an impoverished experience of images. So, you know, this is like a call to action here at the end of our presentation um, you know, all of you 
comics artists and TVIs and others, you know, the Mad Lab is trying to enhance the public understanding of what images and diagrams can do for blind people and to discover what makes something aesthetically pleasing, legible, and meaningful to a blind person working in a tactile medium. And we wanna democratize that access. We wanna ensure that blind people and non-visual learners have everyday access to visually conveyed information, right? It's an ordinary experience in the modern world that folks should and can have given that we've had the technology for decades for blind people to get images, right? Through embossing, through swell form, thermoform, hand methods, and, you know, now even 3D and UV printing, you know, so the idea is that with enough images under fingertips, everyone has opportunities to develop and experience their spatial abilities to the fullest. And that concludes our presentation. Ting, did you have any closing thoughts for anybody? Um, I actually wanted to invite Nick to say a few thoughts because uh, he's coming from into this work um, from with like a very fresh perspective, I think. And I have a sense that a lot of the people who will be watching this recording will also be very new um, to these strategies and ideas. And I, I actually would love to um, hear a few words from Nick. You put me on the spot, Ting. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was just direct messaging you, but then <laughs> the moment came. <laughs> That's all right. I do it to students all the time. So, uh, no, it was, I, I was just so fascinated. I mean, I'm, I, I, the, the, the reason I got intrigued with, with um, exploring this uh, in the first place, um, I make comics as scholarship. Like, that's my work. Um, and it's all about making access to to big ideas that are often sort of limited by, by text. So visual brings access to it. And my classes are all about that. And, and, even, and, and my work specifically, uh, my own work deals specifically with vision as a metaphor for like ways of, see, ways of seeing as ways of knowing. So even while I was making this, this earlier work, um, I was quite aware of the sort of, while I was making access, I was also restricting, you know, there's, there's, there's a segment of the population that I'm just leaving out. Um, so it's been really on my mind. And since meeting Ting, when we both were hired at state um, and teaching these visual communication courses, you know, I'm like, these courses are very exciting, but we're, we're, we're leaving some people out and we're not, and I don't know how to deal with it. Like I don't, it's, it's out of my experience. And periodically there'll be, you know, they'll post you know, like the Marvel comics one. There's been a few really interesting tactile comics that have been produced over the last five, six years, I think. But they're interesting to me, but I'm not actually convinced that they're useful to somebody, you know, to the, the end user, as you said, right? Like, I, I'm not sure that they are. Um, so, you know, I would see one of these things and I'd send it to Ting and I'd be like, um, Ting, does this, is, does anyone actually use this? Um, and so we've been having this conversation and then we had this event last month and it, it really just blew up all the possibilities and you guys are adding a whole new, like, you know, thinking about production. And when you were doing the collage piece, I do stuff with cutouts to get students thinking about how they can make images without having to have drawing skills with, you know, and, and like, as soon as you showed that slide, I'm like, that's an immediately adaptable to the kind of, you know, like I can take what I'm already doing and with a little tiny bit of adjustment in terms of textures that we get and, and thicknesses, we can very quickly build something with a, with a different audience in mind or, or, you know, both audiences in mind. Um, I don't know, that's I'm certainly not a question. Um, I'm just sort of fired up. I'm, I, I wanna drag all my students here and make sure that they're, but I, I, I think I'm now somewhat versed enough to, to start to, in, to convey the enthusiasm for it. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I, I'll say one more thing, because I what my, when I left the, the last event we had, I, I think one of the things that really struck me, I think, it could have been Chancy, but I think it was Josh, uh, Josh that suggested the, just, just that, you know, there's no one size fits all, 
there's no, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, tactile might work for some people and, and, and some situations. And you guys went into that in even more depth where tactile works and where tactile definitely shouldn't be used. Um, and, and where audio has to be used. And, you know, the, the idea of, of sort of tackling one piece from multiple perspectives, you know, using a swell form in one and, and collage in another and an audio thing and, and a sort of charrette around one project is I really want to see. And um, obviously we'll have to be reaching out to you when we get farther along on that. Um, I don't, I'm just fired up. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, well, I had, a, I had a lot of fun, you know, talking to all you folks and, and even just thinking about some of this stuff in this context. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So I, I can I could send you a link to some of my work, but I, like I wrote, draw, I am not really, I make comic books, but a, a cartoonist, I'm a maximal cartoonist, right? Like I draw as many lines <laughs> and as many little things in the background and as much, like they're overly dense comics. So it, it's a, you know, I, I, I've, I've thought in the new work, like, can I make a chapter that could be both tactically printed and and drawn, which would which would force me to like completely change how I make things, which I would enjoy. I mean, it'd be interesting to try. Um, uh, it still well, probably would leave out people. Well, you know, I had a thought about that and we didn't yeah. you might infer it from some of the things that were shown, but we never just came right out and said it. But, you know, remember, tactual. It's mostly a feelable medium. It doesn't, you don't have to make the tactile lines the same as your drawn lines. Right. You right. could actually superimpose a different tactile over your visual artwork. Right. And we actually right. do that a lot with maps because, yeah. you know, yeah. there's an expectation from the visual, the sighted public about what information they want to get from that map. But the feelable layer could be organized differently. Yeah, you have different information. So you could actually be doing an overlay, right? So you're actually doing two comics. You're doing two panels for each right. thing. And one is tells, you know, a slightly different story. Right. Which is pretty cool in itself. And uh, the Rosie the Riveter thing, I mean, that that really struck me. I didn't, you know, I mean, I had a picture of like seeing a tactile drawing of it, but then you you'd encoded so much other information in there. Um, uh, it was really, really eye-opening um, to use the wrong metaphor, probably, but uh, <laughs> um, it was really great. Um, I don't know. Ting, did I, did I? Yeah. Was that okay? Was, <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. And I think um, I love that we, thank you so much for applying for this grant, because now it really gives us a, a space to, to truly be interdisciplinary, I think. Yeah. And we have this collective enthusiasm, and I think what we'll be able to develop out of these interdisciplinary collaborations will be so much more than what any of us could have been doing in, a, in silos. Yeah, Maybe I, I might add, that makes me wanna add one more thing and I can shut up after that. Um, that, that, you know, I, I, I mean, I run a comic studies program and, and I think typically that's sort of, you know, people who study comics for the, the storytelling, for the genre, for, you know, sort of themes and things like that. And, and I've, my, my, my approach to it is much more about as a form of communication. Um, and I think that's why this, you know, talking about this, like, how can we, how can we blow this up even more? And, and in looking around, I mean, there's just nothing. I mean, you know, like there are isolated examples where people have done some really cool projects, but there's, there's, there's no standard for the industry at all. There's no, you know, it just doesn't exist. Um, um, you know, they they found you and they did something for for one comic, but they're not they're not doing anything for their monthly things. They're leaving out a lot of people, and um, I don't know. I'm I'm excited about. It. I'm so glad to know. I've heard about you guys for a long time, so I'm really glad to sort of be in the same room with you. Oh, thank you so much, um, Mad Lab from the San Francisco Lighthouse for the film. Yeah. You guys really are experts, and just your presentation and your kind of easy flow and breakdown of um, this topic was just the perfect introduction. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you guys will come and hang out with us when we kick off our summer um, day long symposium that uh, is, is in the works. <laughs> and um, we'll be able to connect with a, a much uh, 
you know, wider um, community who's all interested in this in this topic of comics accessibility. Um, so I guess we'll conclude by letting people know that if they do want to follow these conversations on social media, we're using the hashtag comics A11Y. Um, A11Y stands for accessibility. And um, just thank you again, you guys. Um, and thanks, Nick, for co-hosting with me. Uh, and thanks, I'm excited, for, excited for next steps. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Nice meeting thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank nice you. Have a great night. Good night. Yeah, good night. This event was made possible with funding from the College of Liberal and Creative Arts Extraordinary Ideas Grant. Event hosts. SF State Comic Studies Program, SF State Program in Visual Impairments, Longmore Institute on Disability. Video editing by Monica Kulanai.